Hello and welcome to the second part of this FreeNest tutorial. In the first part, we built our server, we saw how to install FreeNest on a USB thumb drive, we downloaded the Supermicro IPMI, yeah, and okay. we saw how to use IPMI to turn on our server and modify the BIOS values without the need to connecting a keyboard or a monitor to it. We gave the address 192.168.1.29 to the IPMI interface and we gave the address 192.168.1.30 to the EM0 interface. The EM0 interface is the one allowing our FreeNAS server to be connected to the internet and also the one that is allowing us to connect via web browser to our NAS. For this tutorial, at least for the beginning, I'm going to use a virtual machine and I'm going to connect to it pointing to the address 192.168.1.230. Keep in mind that I'm, I'm using a virtual machine just because it's more easy for me in making this tutorial. All changes that I'm doing from here are intended to be made on the FreeNAS server at 192.168.1.30 or at whatever address you decided to give to your EM0 or EM1 interface. On the virtual machine I'm using four virtual disks of 20 GB each, but let's pretend that are four disks with 3 TB each as in our build. Now let's start. We are going to open a web browser on a client machine pointing to our EM0 interface IP address. The first things that we are going to change is the admin name and to create a password for it. I'm going to change uh, the admin name with the Asimov1973 and I'm going to create a password for my admin user Asimov1973. If you already set a password and you don't remember it anymore, you can reset it using the IPMI KVM console and then entering the option number 7 or if you are on a machine without IPMI installed you can even point your web browser to the IPMI IP address in my case it's 192.168.1.29 click on remote control and then click on console redirection launch console save the file wherever you want click on it and press option number seven now we click on settings and we change our web gui ipv4 address uh, if I let the interface to 0.0.0.0, .0, it will take whatever address I will specify on the IPMI console at the point 1 in the future. Clicking on the IP address, I'm sort of hardcoding the web GUI IP address. But you can let on 0.0.0.0 if you prefer. We are not going to use IPv6 address at the moment. Here we can change the interface language. And here we are going to choose the correct time zone. A field for the 6 log server IP address is also present. Here we have the possibility to save our configuration and uh, when we will be finished uh, we will come back here. In the advanced tab we can change our MOTD or message of the day banner with a more personal message. Ok, so now we click on account, we click on user, we select uh, root and here down we're gonna click change email address. The email address that uh, we are going to give to the root account is destination at hotmail.com. Why destination at hotmail.com? You'll see it in a minute. Now we click on ok, we click on uh, settings, email. Uh, in this example I'm going to use Hotmail, so I already set the outgoing mail server address, the outgoing port and the authentication type. 
If you're going to use Gmail or others, you need to change these values with the one specified by your email provider. In the field username, we're going to type start at hotmail.com. And uh, in uh, the password field, we type the start at hotmail.com password. And we save our settings. From now on, our NAS will communicate with us sending emails from the address start at hotmail.com to the address destination at hotmail.com. Um, can we use the same address for start and destination? Yes, we can. Supposing to use an address like uh, freenas at hotmail.com here and here, what will happen is that freenas at hotmail.com we receive an email from freenas.hotmail.com with all the statistics and reports that Freenas want to send to us. Here I'm showing a report sent by mail from my Freenas to me where I can see how much gigabyte I have in each folder, if my disk are healthy, the EM0 IP address, some security check and some other data. So now from here we go to network settings and global configuration you can access the same uh, menu if you go here network and then global configuration so the information that we need to uh, enter here are the ipv4 default gateway in my case it's 192.168.1.1 one and name server 1, 2 and 3 I give to us the opportunity to enter a DNS um, server um, I'm going to use uh, OpenDNS and um, another one from Google we save and then we set up our interfaces we add an interface and here we have EM0, we can give a name to our interface, we call it uh, main uh, internet connection. Um, we don't want to use the HTTP, what we want to use uh, is a fixed IP address, in our case it will be 30, well now I'm on a virtual machine so for what I said before I'm going to use the ad address 192.168.1.230 netmask in this case is slash 24 so a classical uh, 255.255.255.0 and um, we are going to click ok so what we accomplished until now is to change the default admin name uh, with a more secure one like uh, asimov uh, 1973 we assign a secure password to the Asimov1973 account. We set up the email addresses allowing our NAS to send us an email if one or more disks fail, if somebody tried to access to our NAS using a wrong password and other things like that. And then we specify which default gateway, DNS and IP address our NAS must use for be able to connect to the internet. Skipping link aggregation or LACP, a system which allow you to aggregate more interfaces in a virtual one, we go directly to network summary for check if our entries are good. So here we see EM0 with the address 192.168.1.230/24, and that's correct. We see our DNS or name server. Uh, the first two are OpenDNS and the third one it be, belong to Google for failover and uh, our default route that in my case uh, correspond uh, with the address of my router connected uh, on the internet but uh, in your case it uh, could be a proxy server, a firewall, a load balancer or other devices. Last step before configuring our disk is to be sure that we have some uh, NTP server set. So we close here network, we go on system, we check on NTP server. By default we have three NTP server specified and all three belong to FreeBSD. 
The main function of a network time protocol server or NTP server is to give to our NAS the correct time. Our NAS, thanks to this system, will have its clock always perfectly synchronized and we, when we will receive the logs, report and statistics from our NAS, will be able to track properly any event, being sure that the reported time is correct. On the site uh, www.pool.ntp.org you can see um, a list of uh, NTP servers all over the world. Only in Europe there are 2586 uh, NTP servers and you can use any of them and uh, add them uh, as a failover NTP server to our FreeNAS system. Okay, and there, now let's uh, configure our disk. So we close here network and we go to storage, we expand storage. We go on the volume and uh, then we click view disk. Here I can see my four virtual 20 gigabyte disk. We will pretend, as I said before, that they are our four three terabyte uh, each disks. What I want to check here is that um, smart or uh, self monitoring analysis and reporting technology is enabled. So enable smart true. Double clicking on each disk, we enter in a sub menu. From here, we can set the standby time in minutes. I suggest to prevent using standby as it might shorten the hard disk life. Here we can modify the power management. I advise to use any value between 128 and 254. Keep in mind that using values lower than 254 might affect performances. Another nice function is the one allowing us to change the disk acoustic level. If you have a disk that vibrates so much, even using PC cases that have rubber support or plastic between disk and metal, uh, you can modify the acoustic level until vibrations are reduced to a normal level. Modifying the acoustic level reduces disk performances and transfer rate, but extends the disk life and the life of all the other disks that are in direct contact with it. Now we close this menu and uh, let's click on the left where it says View Volumes. We can see anything here because we still didn't create a volume. A volume is a logical drive or partition. As we know from Windows, a disk might contain more than a partition, named C, D, E, etc. The difference between a volume and a partition is that a volume can span over multiple disks. So we can take a bunch of disks, put them together, and uh, say to the operating system that we want that this group of disks be treated like one big disk. Creating a volume does that. We just need to decide how much disk we want to put in the group and give a name to this group. I'm gonna call my volume red Z2. We click on available disk and uh, simply dragging this uh, circle to the left or to the right, we can add disk to our group of disk or volume. I'm gonna use a red uh, Z2 or Z2 for this build because um, half of the capacity of each disk will be used for parity, allowing us to have a volume that can afford to lose a disk and still be redundant, or in the worst case scenario, allowing us to lose up to two disks without losing any data. Keep in mind that uh, when you need to choose your preferred uh, RAID level, not only you need to consider your requirements, but also remember that although some configurations are possible, not all of them are optimal. Choosing a uh, RAID Z with uh, four disks, for example, Force the volume to have sectors of 43 kilobytes instead of using multiple of 32 kilobytes. FreeNAS admit this configuration, but it will give us a warning saying that this is not an optimal solution. Once our volume is created, we notice that the overall capacity is 34 gigabytes. As we said, in this virtual machine we are using four disks with 20 gigabytes each of capacity. Keeping in mind that the parity in RAID Z2 have a dimension equal to the capacity of two disks, we can say that our four disk volume have now the size of two disks 
and that 40 GB on 80 GB are used for parity. If we click on our volume, we can see down here appearing some icons. The first one allows us to detach our volume. We can consider detaching a volume a sort of unmounting our volume. Why would we want to do that? Well, for instance, if you want to rename your, your volume, you need first to detach it, then rename it and importing it again. Here on the left, you have Auto Import Volume or Import Volume if you want to do it manual. The second icon gives us the possibility to scrub our volume. We will speak about it later. Here we can edit the ZFS option. We can change the compression level, allowing us to compress on the fly our data before that they are actually stored on our volume. This process is CPU intensive and take advantage of a technology called AESNE. If you want to use compression, I advise you to choose your CPU looking for AES-NE compatibility. Our G2130 doesn't support AES-NE. With the fourth icon starting from the left, we can create ZFS dataset. I will explain this later. Next we have create ZVOL, change permission, create a snapshot and check our volume status. We can see from here that our volume named RAID Z2 is made by our four disks DA1, DA2, DA3 and DA4 and that all of them have the suffix P2 that stands for parity 2 or double parity. All of them are online so everything is fine. In part 3 we will create ZFS dataset, create multiple users with different permission configure FTP, Samba and other services, benchmark our system, measure how much electricity our system consumes and many other interesting things. A special thanks to you and to all the friends that subscribe to my channel sustaining me with their positive comments. Finally, but not last, a very special thanks to the FreeNAS community that every day work hard for all of us.